Last problem, problem eight. For this one, you have a ball, or sorry, a disc at the top of an inclined plane, and it's got to roll down the inclined plane. Notice something very important. Rolling means when it gets to the bottom, two things are happening. It's moving and it's spinning, both. So you gotta take that into account. So to do this problem is, it's, sorry, I'm gonna say it. it's, it's the easy thing that you've already done. Now, I say easy and realize when I say that, what I mean is it's easy to do if you know what you're doing. With that said, if you haven't figured that out yet, if you haven't figured out how to do it, it's gonna be hard. So let me show you what you need to do. It's conservate, it's, it's a work energy theorem. Energy initial equals energy final minus the work not conserved, okay? Energy initial, it starts at the top. What kind of energy does it have? Well, there's the three questions. Is it off the ground? Yeah, it is. M G H. Is it moving? Nope, not yet. Is there a spring smash or compressed? Nope, not yet. This chapter it introduces a fourth question. That fourth question is, is it spinning? The answer is no, it's not spinning. Not yet, it will. Final situation down here. Is it off the ground? Nope, now it's on the ground. Is it moving? Yep, sure enough. One half mv squared. Is there a spring, stretch or compressed? Nope. Is it spinning? Yes. Plus one half i omega squared, where i is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular speed. Moment of inertia, another word for that is angular mass. Okay? So we have to do a few things here. We're asked for um, the speed at the bottom and the angular speed at the bottom. Those are the two things we're trying to find here. So let's start with h. We're not given h. We are given this side of the triangle and that angle though. So we find it. h. Uh, let's see. Sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. h is L sine theta. Okay, so we can plug that in here. 1 half mv squared. We know m. We're trying to find v. We'll leave that alone. Plus, plus 1 half i. This is moment of inertia. Now remember, this depends on the object that's spinning. In this case, we've got a disk. So you look it up on that table that's attached to the equation sheet. And the i for a disk is 1 half mr squared. The mass of the disk times the radius of the disk. And omega. Well, that's the other thing we're looking for, but we can't really have two equations, two unknowns in the same thing, so we're going to need another equation here. So we're going to use V equals R omega. This is how you go from the linear world to the angular world and go back and forth. And <clears throat> we're going to solve this for omega. So omega is V over R. We're going to plug that in here. So now we can rewrite this equation. So we have M G instead of h, I'm going to write L sine theta. And then we're going to have equals 1 half m v squared, we're going to leave that alone, plus 1 half i, which is 1 half m r squared, times omega, which is v over r, and don't forget that's squared also. So we've got this big long equation here, and a lot of things happen for us here. First of all, mass cancels out everywhere. So this doesn't matter if it's a little disk or a big disk, it doesn't matter, it, it behaves the same. Secondly, notice that this square here goes to both the V and the R. So this is an R squared downstairs and an R squared upstairs, so that goes away there. Uh, lastly, notice that a half times a half is a quarter. Okay, so let me rewrite this. Now we've got <clears throat> G L sine theta equals one half V squared plus one quarter V squared. Well, a half plus a quarter, isn't that just three quarters? 
So we have G, oops, G L sine theta equals three quarters V squared. And solve it for V. V equals four thirds G L sine theta. Don't forget your square root. And now, once we know V, we can plug that in here to get omega. Those are the two things we're asked for. Now, where did I assign points? <clears throat> I assign points if you, right up here, a third of a point here, a third of a point here, if you knew that, and a third of a point here, if you knew that equation. Then I assigned a half a point here, if you knew that equation, and a half a point if you knew to substitute in here. That equation substituted in over there. Then I also gave you a half a point for this. And lastly, I gave you a half a point for this equation again to use it for part P. OK, that was the last question. Uh, I hope this helps. Uh, the scores are given the same way I gave them on test one. I gave you the, I wrote down the problem numbers, like um, one, two, three, on down to however many problems there were. And if you had it right or wrong, if WebAssign graded it correctly, I gave it the check mark and I didn't add or subtract any points. If I gave you points and WebAssign didn't give you points, or I gave you points and WebAssign gave you some, but it wasn't the same amount, Whatever. Anyway, I would write down first what I gave you, and then subtract off whatever WebAssign gave you, and then <clears throat> plus two. And then I'd do that for all of them, and then I'd add all those extra points up and say add all those points. Okay? And then I already added those points to your score on WebAssign. Now, what I haven't added to your score on WebAssign is after I got done, I wanted to add three more points to everybody's score. So you do that yourself. I haven't done that on WebAssign. I'm not going to. So you take your points on WebAssign, not your percentage, your points. Add three points to that. And then divide it by 21. That's the total possible points. And that's your score. And that's what's in my gradebook. Okay? So there's test two. I hope this helps. Uh, please study through all this stuff. Uh, and because this is very useful in preparation for the final exam. So uh, I hope this helps, and I'll see you soon.